Well, you know, I've been in the industry over 20 years. I've been doing wine for over 10. And you still get some questions. You're like, what? But it also could, don't make that face of the guest. It's yeah, also yeah. like, oh, okay, let me find out. I'm not sure. Again, yes. I don't want to misrepresent. Yes. And by doing that, that also shows more integrity. Absolutely. It also shows, then, then shows that the, the, the customer is going to have a lot more, you know, uh, respect Trust, for yeah, you and everything else. So. There's a purpose for everything that we do. Hi guys, welcome to Mountain View. I'm here at this Michelin star restaurant, Chef TJ. I'm going to meet Paul Carayas. He's the wine director of this restaurant. He's a fine wine dining restaurant, and we're going to talk about how he manages this place and optimizes his wine sales. So uh, my name is Paul Carayas. Again, I am the uh, wine director, uh, sommelier, and every other thing they need me to do here at restaurant Shea TJ. All right, guys, so we're going to go in the restaurant. We're going to see what all Paul does. So Paul, why don't you show us, you know, uh, what are the elements, your inventory, your, your, you know, point of sale, or just, you know, your glass, where do you keep? Just give us a little tour, please. Sure, sure, sure. So uh, we're in a very old I think, Victorian home. It was built in the late 1800s. So we have four small dining rooms. This was one that during COVID we've had to turn into a st staging area. So it's not really using, utilizing as a dining room. Here we have one of our other dining rooms, as you can see, four tables, all white tablecloth. Uh, these are all, you know, custom crafted uh, uh, lamps that we've got, you know, this restaurant's been here for 40 years, so these have been here basically the entire time. So, well, uh, you know, things you can't find anywhere else, that's also what sets us, sets us apart. We have a couple other um, uh, dining rooms in here as well. The staff is still kind of getting ready. So as you can see, we've got some bags and other things, but it's very intimate, very quaint, um, you know, and it's really delivering that that very, uh, you know, intimate sort of service. You know, let's let's say, you know, let's imagine your day and your week, right? So there is some day to day challenges and then there are weekly challenges and there are some emotional challenges. You know, uh, I just want like good 10 uh, tips that people can use from your experience to solve those challenges that you come across, you know, so we can walk over some examples and then you can uh, just guide us on what you would do and how you do it, you know? Sure, sure. So uh, every day is different. Uh, there's always going to be a new challenge. You know, you never know. The main challenge is just trying to make sure that you're fully stocked uh, for everything, making sure that you have the correct amount of wine, not only for your, you know, your by the glass and, you know, bottle selections, but more importantly for my program with uh, all of the wine pairings. Mm -hmm. And the wine pairings is really what is a, the driver of the majority of our sales. Mm -hmm. uh, we sell uh, a lot of wine pairings. And that's also a benefit uh, in the sense that I have a lot of open range or free range to not only buy a lot of unique wines, um, but expose people to wines that they normally wouldn't buy or normally wouldn't even want to drink because it comes down to the pairings in general, you know, where the magic happens is with the food and with the wine. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of leeway in that regard, but it also provides challenges because we are running at least seven, at least seven uh, pairings per mm -hmm. meal. Mm -hmm. So if I'm running three levels of pairings, that's 21 wines that I have open at any time just for the pairings, let alone my BTG and let alone my, you know, bottle sales or champagne sales and all the rest of the stuff. So there's a lot of information to know. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, um, uh, prioritization that mm -hmm. really goes into it, mm -hmm. not only for what's on the floor, but also uh, with the wines them themselves. Uh, the challenges on the floor mm -hmm. when it comes to that, because you know that's that's where the magic really happens, mm -hmm. is being able to prioritize the pairings, making sure you're getting the right things down for the right uh, for the right um, yeah, you know course. Um, but also making sure you're just in line with that. You know, you're not pouring too early, you're not pouring too late. You're able to smooth the people a little bit extra story if you need to. Um, but there is some of that too, to where our pairings are not just, here's your wine, here's the producer and the vintage and the grape variety, and later and I'll see you. Paul, you had a slow month, you know? What normally happens to me is, I'll just first think about it, and then I'll just think about the points, and then there is an action, right? So uh, in that 15, 20 minutes, or maybe an hour or a day, you know, what are the questions you normally ask yourself and how do you come to a plan? Sure. So uh, first off, it's just, you know, you got to read the market. You need to know whether or not uh, 
you know, how, how busy you are, yes. uh, you know, and how much clientele is coming in. Like even during the COVID is a great example to where we're, we're busy for a certain amount of weeks and then all of a sudden things start to decline and being able to adapt in that sense to where mm. you don't order as much. Yeah. Um, but it's always knowing the goal, at least in my uh, restaurant here, uh, that since we have our prefix menu, I already know ahead of time what the pairings are gonna be. So if I'm buying two to three cases for a certain wine, that should carry me through the duration until I switch with something else, uh, you know, to kind of change. So the, the financial goal, is that defined by the general manager or the boss? Let's say, Paul, I need this much wine sales. You're responsible for this? Well, considering that I do that now, okay. um, I, so I do everything. I'm kind of the one that gets to say all that. Okay. Uh, I think there's that fine line with just knowing that if you're spending $15,000 in a month and you haven't sold, you haven't sold $15,000 in wine, that's probably you're going over budget. Okay. Uh, you know, and, and that's, that's one thing to just always keep in mind is it's great to buy stuff, especially when it's not your money. Yeah. And that's one thing that you should always be aware of. Consider it maybe it is your money. Maybe yes. consider that, that you are the owner yeah. and these are the things that you're doing. And, and again, not being overzealous or just buying into what a rep or somebody else may try to push on you. So there's always a fine line. It's just having to just know your program more than anything else, knowing if things are selling and what's not. Mm -hmm. And if there's going to be a hiccup, if you need to pause mm -hmm. and take a break for a few weeks to, you know, to move through a few extra, extra stocks, you know, you may have to decline an allocation. You may have to decline something. And, you know, so that's portfolio. Then what about on the floor, you know, uh, training your reps? What are the things you say to uh, have that second glass poured? Sure. Uh, you know, uh, again, to me, we're not selling, we're letting people buy. And that's the one thing that you should always, at least that I consider when I'm talking to people about wine is I'm not here to sell you something. You know, I can sell you whatever. I can sell you, you, you know, uh, uh, whatever it is, but I'm not, that's not the goal. The goal is to make the customer happy. So asking certain questions as far as like, you know, do you prefer old world or new world? That's a great starting point to narrow things down. Oh, I prefer old world. Okay, you know, is there a certain, you know, country? Do you prefer France or Italy? Narrowing things down. And then even at that point, once you have that, you know, are you looking for something, you know, lighter or heavier? You know, asking the qualifying questions to get people to then buy things themselves. You know, oh, well, I'm not put this in parameter. It looks like you want burgundy. You know, here's one or two choices. And then even asking, what is the price range you're looking for? So you have a range, not a specific price, but a range, 100 to 200, two to 300 or whatever. Now you can narrow it down and give people a choice of two positives, maybe three. But if you give people too many choices, that overwhelms them. But saying like, oh, hey, would you prefer this one from Pomard or this other one from mm. Louis St. George? And then, oh, yeah. I'll take that one. Great. And now we've gone ahead and, and now you've done your job because you've listened to what they've had to say. You've also now facilitated a solution that is tailored essentially to them. It's only because you've listened. And now you, you should have an educated guest knowing what you, knowing your product and knowing from, from what you said. And 99% you know, of the time, most likely that customer is going to be happy. Explain me a little bit more about this pairing concept because you, I saw that you have the prefix uh, food menu, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say this is this uh, food. Now, uh, do they have options? And then you say, okay, what do you feel like? What kind of, of pairing you want to do? And you have three, four pairing packages that goes? So I know there are some establishments that do that to tailor it a little more personal. We are not in the position to be able to personally tailor every single pairing. Obviously, if people have certain preferences over others, I don't have a problem with that. You know, if somebody really wants an all white wine pairing, an all red wine pairing, sure. I may need, you know, we may need to say, we're going to give me a few minutes so I can make sure to to, to, to make sure it's, it's, it's correct and also as perfect as can be because the wine pairings have been determined ahead of time as what is the best pairing for that specific dish. And again, running three doubles of pairings, those are three different pairings that we have for each dish. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, if somebody wants to call an audible and be like, give me your red wine with this fish. All right, you may need to give me a minute. And I also can't guarantee 100% on the fly. That's going to be the best pairing, but it's going to be pretty close. Understood. You know, but that is a challenge and that is a hurdle. And that is something that can come up at any point. Case in point, the other day, uh, we had our second course move to the third course position. It was lobster. Uh, and now I have to pour that with a red wine. I have no problem pouring lobster with a red wine. But it was one of those that I had literally five minutes to figure out what's the pairing I'm going to pour with this. Luckily, I've had mm. this Canary Island Red sitting and waiting for me, the Eichlein uh, 2018 But uh, don't vintage. you write the what you're going to do already in advance and then... Not for us. Okay. Our menu... That allows you the flexibility. Our, correct. Our menu is, uh, it's always going to be a mystery. So mm. at least here at this establishment, we don't we, we don't um, give any of the items for menu or wine yeah, I noticed, until the completion actually, yeah. of the Even meal. the food is... Yeah. So that does buy me some time. 
uh, to whereas, you know, if there needs to be something like this changed to where the slops are just changed and then I pour this canary red uh, to where the velute in this sauce was, it, you know, it's lobster velute, but it was infused with a little Satsuma Mandarin. The Canary Island red that I poured, while it's a lighter red, it's some crunchy, beautiful acidity. You have some pomegranate and a little bit of uh, raspberry, but then this little underlying citrus orange that works so well with the velute that just, I mean, I have to, oh, have to. It's one of the best pairs I've had, but it's also done it on the fly. But I yeah. also have that from experience and Got also it. knowing the components, because again, when it comes to pairing, it's not just about the protein, it's about all the components of the dish. And now having this as being a red wine with the lobster, you know, and now we're even shaving some white truffles over it. Mm. It still is amazing. It's mind blowing. So, so, so I think it's it's one of the challenge, as you said, is if food changes or moves here and there, then you just have to quickly adapt to it. You have to adapt to it, but but that also comes again with the experience of knowing what's on your list. Okay. You know, if you come in, if you're coming into a wine program that you don't know what the products are, you're gonna have a much difficult or more mm. difficult time trying to do that mm. if you haven't tasted it. You know, if you have the flexibility of corvining and getting a taste of kind of everything you have, yeah, you yeah. have a better understanding. But that also does come with, um, you know, comes comes with experience and just again knowing your product more than anything. I just want to give uh, people a little bit more context here, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, if you can just explain the pricing so people understand the, um, the experience and the clientele you're dealing with. You know, I, I think, uh, is that okay to say? Of course. So I think it's, uh, till what I saw was 200 uh, bucks per person for the food and wine is how much, Paul? 150 for the nightly pairing, 295 for the grand. So you're talking about average 400 to 450 a person. So thousand bucks on an oh, average. minimum. For per guest act check average is well over three to $400 per person. Yeah. yeah. So uh, a lot of times I assume that that kind of guest comes here for special occasion Correct. or they just have money and they know exactly what they want. I want my thing, exactly. bring it on, right? Exactly. Uh, let's go detail in that. Like what, what things come up there? So you have your novices, people who are not, you know, 100% fully in the, in the wine uh, you know, or into wine. Um, have more of maybe a novice palate, okay. um, but that's also something that's a benefit that let me start over. I should say I've grown the following for the wine pairings here at JTG over the last five years. There, there has come to know that there is a following that these are not going to be traditional pairings. These are not going to be classic pairings. That may happen every now and then, but I use a lot of products from around the world, things that people wouldn't expect, pairings that are not traditional at all, but it's something that is eye-opening. It is something that is fun. But you also want people to try different things. That, but that also sets ourselves apart. And right. then that's another reason why I can command the prices that I do for the pairings. You know, I mean, if you're gonna sit down for a you know $300 pairing here, I mean, you can basically get the same pairing, or not the same, but you can get a similar pairing at the French Laundry for the same price, but it's gonna be a lot more classic. Mine's not. You're gonna find items that are exotic, items that are just not found anywhere else. Because I also, once I do find those exotic items, I buy it all because I want to make sure that our program is set apart from each other. And now that also poses another problem, is making sure that your program is also not only one that is amazing, but one that sets itself apart. Because if you're like everybody else, then what's the point? You mm. know, I can go anywhere and have that. I can go to, you know, another Michelin restaurant and have the same thing. If it's if we're all the same, then again, what's the point? So you have to differentiate yourself and differentiate yourself not only with good products, but with good knowledge. Because at the end of the day, I view myself as a storyteller. I view myself as somebody who's trying to bridge the gap between the consumer and the producer and give people a sense of place, hmm. you know, especially with COVID. Nobody's been able to travel. How do we travel? I travel with my glass. I travel with what's in my glass and, and I travel hmm. to, to, to the world, to hmm. what's around us with that. And there's so much good wine out there nowadays that you're doing yourself a disservice if you're not trying everything that there is. What not to do on the floor? Uh, what not to do? What for the sommelier? Well, for one, don't ever call anybody a guy. Like, hey guys or even, hey folks, none of that stuff. You know, uh, the, for, for me, well again, also being in this area, we've had a lot more um, gender neutral requests. So not even saying sirs or, or ladies or madams. I've so had hi. to actually, yeah, kind of, or you know, or how are we all doing today? Um, but it's trying to be as Amazing, poised yeah. and as professional, but also having enough manners. <sighs> I don't know if anybody watches Downton Abbey, but that's kind of the way it is. Pish posh, pish posh, pish posh. It's kind of how you should be, but at the sense, you know, keeping it personal. You know, you're never coming up to a table, hey, how's it going? It's never like that. You're coming, you are professional, you are here to give people an experience. 
consider yourself as a professional and also they're looking at you as to being a professional. Mm. So not only act the role, but then also, you know, complete with the role. Mm. You know, when you're pouring, you know, again, pouring things open handed. Mm. If somebody's sitting over here, if I can use a table, for example, mm. you know, if somebody's coming over here, I'm going to pour this way. Mm. If they're sitting here, if I'm not coming around this side, I'm going to switch hand and then pour with the left. So that's such an important skill. Like you have to be sort of a two hand. Uh, Correct. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. You definitely have to be a actress when it comes to these sort of things. Um, and it's also knowing your pores is very important. Knowing what a one ounce pour is, knowing what a two ounce pour is. Knowing because what a you're not going to use is. anything, right? You're Correct, because on my pairings, I pour uh, two ounce pours. So in a bottle, there's 25 ounces essentially. So if I'm pouring two ounces per pour, that means technically I should get 12 full people poured out in one bottle, have an extra ounce-ish for myself to taste to make sure that the bottle was sound. Mm on a good night. Now, I mean, you may have to pour other people off, but I look at it as a bottle. If I'm pouring two ounces, I'm going to get at least 10 pours out of, I should really get 12. That's maximizing the profitability of the bottle itself. Mm -hmm. So those are all things that are super important is being able to freehand and do those things without thinking about it. Also, not just eyeing it on a glass, because you may go to another establishment where they say pour two ounce pour, and it's a different glass than what you're used to. If you don't know that, then that's mm -hmm. something you should do. You know, bartenders are really good at this, knowing the count. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. If I'm pouring a two ounce pour for myself, it's a four count. It may be different for other people, but those are things where I don't need to look at a glass. Mm. I can talk to you this whole time, just pour it and know that that's where I've hit it. Wow. Blah, 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 and, and done. But that's wow. also the thing, making the connection. That also comes with time. Yeah, that's you know? freaky because you're looking at that, you know, and then. So it's all those things, but that's also delivering on the service, you know, and delivering on that aspect. And again, that just comes with, with, with time and experience. Yeah. Um, but those are all the, it's all those little things that Absolutely. matter. Um, you know, and again, more importantly, if, even if, you know, maybe somebody didn't put the glasses properly, you need to move things. It's always coming in. If, if you ever need to disrupt anything on the table, mm. pardon my reach, excuse my reach, and you move things, and it's not move, move, it's slow. Mm. You know, it's methodical. Everything needs to be done. There, there's a purpose for everything that we do, mm. you know, and that's really what it comes across. And then people start to realize that, oh, I've never had this experience before. Wow, this was elevated. Amazing. Now I can understand why I'm paying the prices. Now I can understand why I'm sitting here Absolutely. experiencing this. Because at the end of the day, what we do, as Danny Meyer has said, very well known in this whole industry, is we're creating an emotional experience. Yes. That's what's happening. These people are going to have an emotional experience tonight. Are we going to give them a positive one yeah. or a negative one? We need to give them a positive one, otherwise we're not going to have repeat guests. So, so uh, in this kind of establishment, services, number one, hospitality, storytelling, uh, I, I would say that brings me to the people side of things. What kind of questions do you ask your people in the interview process to know that they are, I think that that person is good at storytelling, you know, is there any particular five or six good questions? I think it's more honestly just getting a feel for people, getting a feel for people's background uh, and not only their life background and history, but their work background, even if that's, you know, maybe somebody transitioning into the hospitality industry from somewhere else, because at the end of the day, wine is subjective, but as a wine director, you have to think of it as being objective because there's so many different people that have so many different backgrounds, so many different uh, experiences that will change their experience with that glass of wine than what I have. So being it's subjective, I may like something and know what's in this glass, but it's again, you have to think about it's not about you. It's about what everybody else is going to experience. Mm. And at the end of the day, if you're able to now bridge your mm. experience with theirs and make it harmonious, mm. that is where the beauty, that's where the real craft comes into it, at least in my how, opinion. How are you listening to them, like their body language, their first sip? Like, I'm sure there is some science behind reading. Uh, there you know? is. There, there's all of that. You know, I mean, again, being able to have that understanding of people's, like you said, body language, people's vibe, if, if you will. Uh, but a lot of that, it comes into context. It's all also how you approach the table. If you have a table that's come in that's running a little bit late and they're a little flustered, their energy is going to be off. They may not be as receptive. Maybe a better hospitality move in that sense is to pour them a glass of champagne or some bubbles and just be like, I know you're running a little late. Let's go ahead and get you started and settle down. And now once you've calmed down, you've had a little drink, you know, you're able to fall into the groove, you will be more receptive. That's a good point. The other problem or the other I shouldn't say problem, but another thing that I find with a lot of Psalms that are novices are, like you said, kind of asking questions, but going too far to build too much of a rapport. And then also too, at the same time, uh, wanting to say too much about a certain wine or about a certain thing. If you can't read your guests, if you see that guest glaze over, they're not going to hear anything anymore. And you're just giving them information to give them information. Now, that's the thing. Are you just doing that because you're nervous and because this is all you know? Or are you actually knowing your product, know the story behind it, do the five extra minutes of research? There's plenty of times, too, where on the fly, I'll have to Google something or I run away in the corner, Google something. And it's like, you know, you got to give the people 
you know, you got to give the people the points. If they want more, they'll buy it. They'll ask, you know, so it's, it's, it's always that, that, that sales techniques as well as as long as you're confident, people are going to believe what you want to say. But that's another thing. Don't ever misrepresent. If you don't know a certain question, the last thing you want to do is jeopardize the integrity of yourself or the integrity of your program. Even me as myself, being where I am today, if I don't know something, I'll say, I'm sorry, I don't want to misrepresent. Let me find out for you and then do a quick Google search. It's not that yeah. hard, but yeah. but you know, those are all challenges that we deal with yeah. literally on, on a daily basis. Because yeah. sometimes you get questions, even me doing this is, well, you know, I've been in the industry over 20 years. I've been doing wine for over 10 and you still get some questions. You're like, what? But it also could, don't make that face of the guest. It's yeah, also yeah. like, oh, okay, let me find out. I'm not sure. Again, yes. I don't want to misrepresent. Yes. And by doing that, that also shows more integrity. Absolutely. It also shows, then, then shows that the, the, the customer is going to have a lot more, you know, uh, respect Trust, for yeah, you and everything else. That. So, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, it, it all, it all, it also comes back to again, just, just the person, the individual. What happens behind the kitchen? Like, you know, walk me over uh, your, your day. Like you come first, first one hour, first 15 minutes to wrap. Walk me where you know they start. To so end. when I first get in, um, because I have a lot of other duties, it's more the administrative, back of the house sort of things, mm -hmm. making sure that I've got uh, you know my menus and lists ready to go, making sure everything is fully stocked. The walk-in, uh, the wines that my gear on and everything, so everything. Hang on, hang on. So the walk-in meaning the reservations you see? Sure. No, I'm sorry. Or so the walk-in is in the back of the house. Is essentially your refrigerator. Uh, okay. That's where it's the cooler. It's okay. everything uh, for our wines by the glass, okay. for champagnes. Things that I can put, you know, six to ten bottles of, okay. and keep it cold and okay. ready to go. Okay. That's the walk-in, uh, and that's where those wines would be. Otherwise, we have our white wines, you know, in a wine fridge. Yeah. But you know, for wines that we're using on a daily basis, those are all sitting in the walk-in. Yeah. Uh, so we have that, that you know, that's thing, making sure that's all stocked. Yeah. Also with sodas and beers and all the other things. Yeah. What time you come? Uh, hold on, no, that changes every day, honestly. Wow. So, I mean, our service starts at 5 p.m. and our last, our first seating's at 5. Last seating can anywhere be from 8 to so, 9 p.m. So, what I wanted to ask is, let's let's assume you come at 3. What time your sommeliers come? 4? You come before them? So, our front of the house employees, if they're the openers, come at 3.30. If you're a closer, you come at 4.30. You will be working here an eight-hour shift. Without question. Okay. I was here last night till almost 2 a.m. Understood. Where I was going was, you know, you have four sommeliers in an example, and you are the wine director. Are you responsible for them as well, I believe, right? Like, right? And what if someone just says, I can't make it today? Uh, what do you immediately do? So first off, I wish I had four sommeliers. I have zero sommeliers right now. I had one sommelier who was my assistant, uh, who left to go take over another program. Yeah. So right now, I am also the floor sommelier. You are, okay. So I do everything. I no. wish I had so that problem of absenteeism is not there. Well, I mean, <laughs> correct. I mean, it's not there now, but I mean, if if it were the case that that sommelier couldn't yeah. happen, you're in a position as the wine director that you need to step in and do that role. Yeah. At the end of the day, just like a general manager or anything else, you are the last line of defense. All right. So if you don't have people showing up, you're the one that needs to be there. I mean, that just yeah. And that 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 should be almost I feel without without question that you should just know that that if you're gonna run a program and. Now your clientele, your, your or your person, you know, yeah. your you know your people who are supposed to be there aren't there. That you need to go ahead and do that, and it shouldn't matter if you're working more hours or not either. What you have know? you found the hardest, uh, Paul? You know, like which it, it just uh, takes a toll on the job. Meaning, uh, in a, in a positive way, right? Like this is this is tough. I think uh, meaning uh, it exhausts you. Like this is a hard problem. There's a lot of things that can exhaust you in this job, um, because at least. And I can only speak right now. I've been in other positions in other restaurants, but this one, being that we're Michelin, being at the highest caliber that we're at, and the way things run, I mean, this is a different animal than most restaurants. This is high stress, and it is because everything is at the utmost level. The only way that I can portray that is to say, if you're a customer and you're paying top dollar as you would here, if you are not getting the creme de la creme and the most excellent service, then what is the point of you paying this money? And now we've lost clientele. So if everything is not at top tier always, mm. and that right there, I think is the most exhausting is making sure that everything is always the top tier and we are producing at the top tier, you know? And now while we may be also a Michelin restaurant that is not as stuffy as others per se, we are, our whole crew is a lot more approachable uh, in, in that sense. We deliver a lot more, I feel like, just based upon my experience. Um, that it, 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 it's a very homey sort of component, but it is one of those that is still at the highest caliber to where there's so much stress. I mean, 
You know, I'm already a perfectionist. Stress of perfecting the whole art. I, I, again, it's going in the Ritz Carlton versus a, like any three star. Uh, uh, the uh, expectations are just there. That's why it's, you're stressful. Again, because in my opinion, at least, if we're not hitting those moments every single time, being consistent, because that's what Michelin's all about. If we're not being consistent with those things, then we have now not delivered for our customer, and now our customers. Um, you know, experience has been impacted negatively, and that's the last thing that we want. So the stress is is to make sure that it is always perfect every single time, mm. without question. Mm. And that does run a high level of stress. Mm. Absolutely. Um, you know, but that being said, it's rewarding, at least for myself, because I've been in this industry for so long, that's what I thrive off of. Amazing. I mean, you're at the, at the top level, you know, for the job you do. Uh, give some tips for you know young sommeliers who are trying to become a sommelier and then a head sommelier, then a wine director, then wine director and a Michelin star. You know what, what kind of path is this? Uh, where can you go? What all can you do? And how do you? What, what's your tip? Let's say in five years, here's my goal. I want to become Michelin star. You know what did you do? So um, goals are great. Uh, having those goals, but don't think that it's 100% finite. Um, there's always a lot of flexibility and maybe new things that happen. You know, as people say like oh, opportunities or chance happens, that's only really when opportunity meets preparation. So if you've prepared yourself enough and you've done enough in your career, then all of a sudden you have a new opportunity to be a Michelin star director, well, that's not chance or, or luck. That's, yeah, exactly. That, that's, that's you're prepared. But if you weren't prepared and you knew about this opportunity, you're probably not gonna get you know considered. True. And that's also something, be humble about where you are in, the, in, 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 in your role in, in this whole industry. It's a journey, it's not a destination. And always remember that too. I had to pass, or I had to take my certified sommelier exam three times to pass. The first time I, I nailed my blind tasting and didn't do theory. The second time it was opposite, opposite. The third time we hit it all. But it was. Got it. Uh, give me an example of, it's a very uh, common question, but I just want to understand some real tactics. Or what, what is the difference that happens in this restaurant, let's say it's the service-wise versus a normal, a good restaurant still, like a nice steakhouse, let's say. You know, like the eye to eye, like and any uh, things that are just like Michelin, this you have to do, that's in your book. Like this is a SOP, standard operating procedure, you know, this is how we stand. You have to look at the customer, you can't let, uh, one thing mainly, open hand service for what, everything. What is that? Open hand service meaning that if you're sitting to, if you're at position one at a table and everybody should know this, if you're sitting at a table one, two, three, and four, position one, you're going to be served open handed, meaning I'm coming at you like so, not closed handed, coming at you like so. Uh, so standard operating procedures when it comes to serving fine dining is, you know, you serve from the left and you pick up from the right. But at the same time, if you're in a closed quarter, again, you still need to do open-handed. So I'm not gonna come to you if you're sitting where you are now and just be like, here you go, and show you the back of my elbow or my mm -hmm. shoulder. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna come at you warm, more inviting with the front of my, my, my body. But that would be the standard more than anything else is you know you serve from the left and pick up from the right. Mm -hmm. Technically, women are always supposed to be served first, mm -hmm. technically, although mm -hmm. you know that has been modified to where essentially you're just kind of going around. Mm -hmm. But it's always also fine dining, you know, counter or I'm sorry, it's clockwise service always. Okay. Never okay. counterclockwise. You're not supposed to, you're Good not to supposed know. to jump back and forth either. I mean, that's also something being a sommelier, you know, if the quartermaster sommeliers that they test you on, and you know, even a certified, if you start going counterclockwise, you will get dinged okay. uh, for that. So, you know, everything should be clockwise. And again, you know, it's it's the poise. If you're going to reach in front of somebody, yeah. pardon my reach, excuse my reach. If you have to impact the guest at all, that's a negative thing. If the guest has to move back, you're technically impacting their point. impacting their, their time. Very you're supposed good. to be seen and not heard essentially yes uh you know while everybody is important and everybody's personality is important you need to realize that in this scenario you're not true it's the guest that's important yeah you Just don't come, need to do show off and, yeah you don't yeah. need to show off anything now if you've built a rapport to Very where true. that's acceptable sure that also comes in with finding that fine line of being acceptable like yeah, that's you know really again it's, it's about them there, this may be their one time yeah. going to the michelin restaurant and that needs to be the best time ever mm, and this true. is another thing where being that we do this job as sommeliers or as you know just people in the restaurant industry we do the same thing every day it's the same thing especially you know this you know at a restaurant like this where it's it's a set menu so it is it should be essentially the same every day like you know we just have the same same things unless the menu changes but it's 
it's it's not the same for the guest. And that's the problem is where you, yes. you know, sometimes we can come become complacent or just be like, oh, I have to go to work today. And it's the same thing. Here you go, blah, blah, blah. Here's this dish. So it shows in your... Right, yeah. but it also too, it's just always remembering like, the, that's not the guest experience, yes. you know? So, and, and, and again, we get new guests all the time. Yeah. That's why I always encourage and behoove all of my staff to go out and eat. Go out yeah, and eat at restaurants, super especially challenging. Muslim restaurants. You know, get an idea as to why we are one of the best one stars when we should be two with what we deliver. We should be, and we've been striving for a while, but see the difference in that. You know what I mean? And, and take take into account, you know, not only what the staff is doing, but, but your experience, because at the end of the day, you're still the guest. And we should also enjoy ourselves being in this industry that sometimes True. we're like, no, I'm not going to spend the money on, you know, 100 or 200 or 100 dollar dinner. It's like, well, why not, man? You know, like, no offense, but I work so hard that I, I, that I would hope not. But, you know, I could drop dead on the floor tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And dang, I didn't go out and go out to eat over the weekend because why? Like, yeah. you know, it's one of those things where we do work extremely hard, high, high, high stress, that we should also be enjoying the fruits of our labor, enjoying what we have, not only in an industry, yeah. but hey, the more you get out there and expose yourself in this industry, mm -hmm. the more you start to network with people, the more people start to know who you are. They start to realize where you work. It's a whole thing. And that's the other thing that if I can only stress to people in this industry is the more you talk to people in your industry, the more you become known. Networking is networking is so much more Absolutely. than just like, oh, I'm going to this business event. Here's my business card. Yeah, it's not yeah, that. It's starting yeah. to get the connection between people, yes, starting absolutely. to learn about each other and actually taking an investment in yeah. other people. Yeah. That's where you're going to start building your ground. Like how we're doing networking. right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, and, that, and that's what all comes about. Yes. You know, and then that's one thing I think younger, uh, you know, the younger generation, younger people in this industry can start to learn, especially if you don't have a full background in restaurants Agreed. and you've just been learning, you know, your educational part of things that there's so much more that it's all, again, it's about who you know, not always about what you know. What you know is important and maybe True. get you through the door, but you need to learn life lessons. You know, True. you need to be street smart, not just school smart. Street smarts, reading people, reading situations, reading what's going on, being able to prioritize and being able to adapt. All of that becomes into what's gonna make you great. <laughs>